it's always fun to be here at Georgetown, and it's a pleasure to be back again. Uh, I want to thank Tom, not only for the kind comments, comments but for also the invitation. And uh, like uh, most rowers, we miss each other on the river because, as I reminded Tom, it, it, it's a special person who's attracted to rowing. Remember, it is the only Olympic sport done backwards. So that tells us both about my character and maybe Tom's character on that. So we sometimes miss each other. So I want to thank Tom for the invitation again, and the Center for Security Studies and the School of Foreign Service for the invitation. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of my uh, staff have actually attended, and actually one of my uh, staff who was here before, ah, there she is, Heidi, uh, has left my staff to come back and attend the school. So we have a, a good, close relationship with Georgetown. Um, what I'm going to talk about is, I think, one of the most important issues that's going to be facing you as foreign policy advisors and maybe makers of foreign policy in the future. And no, it has nothing to do with Cuba or cigars, the other kind of cigars. It has nothing to do with the Iranian nuclear deal, even though that's going to be debated for God knows how long um, on the Hill. Uh, rather, it relates to how we, as a nation, conduct development and reconstruction in conflict in post-conflict environments. A subject that I know a little bit about from having spent the last three years over the last three years in Afghanistan. This issue, I would argue, is one, of, one that will become increasingly important and has become important as our involvement in hot spots like Iraq, Syria, and Yemen escalate. Perhaps there won't be a reconstruction mission for all of those places, but I would be willing to bet that somewhere down the line, we will be involved in rebuilding places that are insecure, suffering from widespread corruption, involved in widespread narcotics trafficking, and with extremely low levels of development. If we are to have any chance for success in those endeavors, we must seek to learn and improve upon our almost decade and a half spent rebuilding Afghanistan. Now, as the SIGARD, the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, my business focuses solely on the U.S. effort to rebuild Afghanistan. It basically involves checking alleged facts, digging out actual facts, identifying weaknesses, failures, uncertainties, corruption, and delusion. So you can imagine, as Tom has alluded to, how popular I am here in Washington. <laughs> Congress created my office in 2008. Unfortunately, six long years after the reconstruction process began, and endowed our small agency accordingly with a unique set of authorities. We are the only U.S. oversight body focused solely on Afghanistan. And with the authority to audit, inspect, and investigate, and otherwise examine any and all aspects of reconstruction, regardless of the U.S. agency that's involved. We are not a component of any federal agency that makes us unique. And unlike most other IG shops around town, we are mandated by our statute to look at the whole of government approach, including the international cooperation with the United States to reconstruction in Afghanistan. While independent, we are subject to congressional oversight itself. And congressional dissatisfaction with my predecessor led to his forced resignation over three years ago. President Obama appointed me then to serve as a special IG when I started, and I started in July of 2012. Now I've spent decades, as Tom has alluded to, as a federal prosecutor, Capitol Hill staffer, and also as a partner in an international law firm. But for the breadth, challenge, and importance of the work, none of my prior jobs quite compares to being the singer. To carry out our work, SIGAR employs about 200 auditors, investigators, inspectors, attorneys, technicians, analysts, researchers, writers, and other staff. 
Most of them are located in our Arlington headquarters. Uh, but we also have about 40 staff in Afghanistan. And we have more than all other oversight agencies combined in Afghanistan looking at the reconstruction. So far, we have published 28 quarterly reports to Congress, plus hundreds of financial and performance audits, inspections, testimonies, and other reports. The end result of all this has work, work has been we have uh, identified well over $2 billion in savings for the U U.S. taxpayer. Now, what are those 40 people and the 200 people looking at? To be short, they're looking at the $110 billion that Congress has appropriated for Afghanistan reconstruction since 2002. To give that number some meaning, because nobody understands what a billion, 200 billion, 100 billion, trillion dollars actually is. If you take that 110 billion and adjust it for inflation, Afghanistan reconstruction exceeds the value of the entire Marshall Plan to rebuild all of Western Europe after World War II. Even now, 13 years into our Afghan adventure, there is nearly 12 billion dollars more in the reconstruction funds waiting in the pipeline appropriated, authorized, but not yet spent, and we have made promises we will spend more to come in Afghanistan. The bottom line and the dirty little secret is, if we don't support the Afghan government to the tune of six to ten billion dollars a year, there will be no Afghan government. It will collapse. So we are in for a little bit more time and a little bit more money in Afghanistan. Plenty of time for you to graduate and get great jobs working in the government or some think tank or contractor to help out. Right now and for years to come, SIGAR as well as the other oversight bodies will act in an essence as America's insurance policy for not only the $110 billion in reconstruction, but the combined 13-year war fighting and reconstruction effort. And the war fighting costs a lot more than reconstruction. That total comes to close to a trillion dollars. We ensure, to the best of our ability, that the entirety of that taxpayer investment does not fall victim to waste, fraud, and abuse, and that the Afghan government does not collapse as the result of those problems. Now, as students of foreign affairs, international security, and public policy, Many of you will no doubt go on to become policymakers, or at least advise policymakers in the future. It is with that in mind, I want to speak above you about a concept known as evidence-based policymaking. While this may sound like a wonky inside the beltway jargon, it's obviously something you probably are going to have to study and get tested on. Uh, I assure you, it is really a simple idea and an important idea. Because what evidence-based policymaking is, is the general notion that policymakers can achieve substantially better results by using rigorous evidence to inform their decisions. That's common sense, right? That decisions based upon the best possible, most scrutinized information might have a leg up on decisions that are not so designed. When dealing with the massive Afghanistan reconstruction effort, one might rightly surmise that questions such as, does the project have measurable metrics for determining outcomes? Do the Afghans actually want the project? And can the Afghans sustain we, what we are giving them? These are all important in determining the success or failure of the U.S. mission to build a secure and stable Afghanistan. These are just a few of what I call the seven questions that I have asked agency decision makers to take into account when authorizing and implementing reconstruction projects. I ask them to consider those questions because simply put, knowing the success or failure of a given intervention is vital to future strategic planning allocation of resources, and in short, policy. The bottom line is that if you don't have a means of knowing whether or not your programs are succeeding, the policymaker's job 
has become that much harder. Now, I'm not saying that the major players in the reconstruction mission, DOD, State, and USAID, never set baselines or other performance metrics to assess their programs. But what I am saying is that greater scrutiny needs to be exercised along every step of the project management cycle, from selecting appropriate baselines to measuring and monitoring data against those starting points, and finally, the interpretation of the so-called results. Chances are, if my office has issued a report on a project, there was a fundamental breakdown in one of those steps along the way. So perhaps it becomes incumbent upon me to explain how to avoid such occurrences in the future. First, before even considering where to set a baseline for a given project, it is a worthwhile exercise to stop and think about what it is you are trying to achieve. What is your end goal? Your theory of change, to use what a USAID term. One Congressional Research Service report written on the subject of evaluating foreign aid notes that a key problem in measuring aid effectiveness is that, quote, aid provided for development objectives is often conflated with an aid provided for political and security purposes, unquote. I, use, I see this all the time in Afghanistan. The general assumption no matter which agency is providing the assistance, is that the bar is so low that any infusion of funding or technical expertise will improve the status quo. In other words, the initial objective doesn't need to be precise because the intervention will surely do some good in some area. While this may be true in many cases, especially in the early days, just after we kicked the Taliban out, we must hold ourselves to a higher standard when billions of taxpayer dollars and the sacrifice of so many hang in the balance. We must demand precision, and we must never ever confuse outputs for outcomes. Now, I am often called a naysayer and get complaints from agencies that I don't publish enough good news stories about their work. Besides reminding them I'm not a cheerleader, but in the business of detecting waste, fraud, and abuse, I also find it necessary to point out that I'm not even the one setting the standards for their work. They do that on their own. I am merely the person responsible for holding the agents accountable, agencies accountable to their own goals and standards. Much like an empire, an umpire in a baseball game, I don't make the rules, I just enforce them. Now that brings me to my next point. The baseline that you choose inevitably will become the standards for which you, and eventually others, will judge your work. Accordingly, set realistic, measurable standards. Now, in social science, this can be tricky. There is often little to go on in the terms of determining reasonable standards. And in many cases, it is often an educated guess based upon imperfect information. In a conflict-affected environment, such as Afghanistan, this challenge is amplified. That said, perhaps constructing buildings to US or European standards across the board in such an environment might be unwise, especially if we expect the Afghans to maintain and sustain what we give them. Now, don't mistake me here. I am not making a judgment call about what is quote-unquote good enough for the Afghans. And I'm certainly not saying that the infrastructure we build for them should be an inferior infrastructure in any way. What I'm saying is that standards vary widely from country to country, region to region, and when setting a baseline standard, one should be cognizant of the place you're working. Lastly, Policy decisions, far from existing in a vacuum, must be based upon honestly measured results. This is where the wonky, evidence-based policymaking term comes from. As President Obama said in a speech just last month, 
the lesson from over a decade of war should be, quote, <coughs> on the front end. Ask tough questions. Subject, subject our own assumptions to evidence and analysis. Resist the conventional wisdom. Worry less about being labeled weak. Worry more about getting it right, unquote. Now, the president was speaking about the need to give diplomacy a chance before hastily resorting to everyone's favorite hammer, the U.S. military. But the same words could and should be used to describe reconstruction policy in Afghanistan and national security making policy more broadly. If after 13 years and so much blood and treasure invested in Afghanistan, we cannot be honest with ourselves about our successes and failures, we are not only leaving the Afghans in a precarious position, but also putting our entire mission there at risk. I want to talk about one particularly <laughs> important program in Afghanistan that highlights those issues, and I'm going to grab this water before I got it first. Um, and that is the Department of Defense's Commander's Emergency Response Program, called CERC. Something you must be teaching about, uh, you know a little bit about. Yeah. Between November 2003 and June 2014, Congress appropriated about $3.7 billion for CERC, which was designed to help U.S. commanders in Afghanistan respond to urgent humanitarian relief and reconstruction requirements. Congress gave DOD broad authority to spend appropriated funds, which were not bound by normal procurement and federal procurement regulations. CERP funding was intended for small projects costing less than $500,000, although they could go above a million, but had to be then approved by the commander of Central Command. A member of Congress once jokingly referred to that program as, quote, well-intentioned walking around money, unquote. In Afghanistan, CERP funds were used in all 34 provinces, although most of it was used in Kandahar and Helmand provinces, where a lot of activity, insurgency activity was occurring. According to SERP's authorizing legislation, as well as DOD's standard operating procedures for the program, SERP's purpose was to, quote, enable U.S. military commanders to respond to urgent humanitarian relief and reconstruction requirements, unquote, in order to, quote, immediately assist the Afghan people. Now, let's think about that. Humanitarian relief and reconstruction is not really an objective in and of itself. Would USAID say that the objective, their objective is to provide foreign aid? No. Providing foreign aid is what USAID does, but it does so to further US foreign policy and national security objectives. Incredibly, for the first nine years of SERP's existence, we have not been able to find a single clearly articulated mention of the program's objectives in any official document beyond the generic input of, quote, humanitarian relief and reconstruction, unquote. In 2012, SERP guidance finally explicitly stated desirable effects of the program in two main thematic categories, counterinsurgency and economic development. Prior to this, SERP guidelines listed only categories of projects such as education, health, agriculture, and others, but did not identify explicitly goals of the program. Later guidance managed to almost completely eliminate the counterinsurgency objective altogether, pulling them out of the body text and exiling them to the annex of a 270-page document. The introduction of this same guidance states that, quote, commanders should be ex executing projects resulting in measurable effects that support counterinsurgency objectives. So according to DOD, commanders should exercise, execute projects that can be measured according to objectives that are not openly stated. Perhaps even more puzzling is that CERP regulations forbade program funds being used for the, quote, direct or indirect benefit, quote, of coalition troops. Yet these same regulations state that one of SERP's desired effects is, quote, 
force protection or reducing attacks on coalition forces. And we wonder now why there is confusion about SERP and SERP's effectiveness. When you have such a diversity of goals, some implicit, some explicit, and some blatantly contradictory, it becomes impossible to tell which goal dominates. And for oversight bodies, the goal for which people can be held accountable. Part of the problem is the baseline assumption without any actual grounding in any data that the program is helping to begin with. To commanders, the degree to which it is helping doesn't really matter as long as it is priving, providing utility for their troops. The military is not really in the business of calculating return on investment for taxpayer funding. It is the business of waging and winning engagements and doing so with the fewest number of casualties. Because this program was initially designed without explicitly stated objectives and stringent performance metrics, it largely lends itself to anecdotal evidence by small unit commander, commanders who view the program as another tool in their tactical toolkit, much like a weapon system or other force multiplier. Therefore, it should not surprise anyone that the sustainability of SERP-funded schools have been singled out by my agency and other oversight bodies because they're literally crumbling and falling apart. Or that SERP-funded hospitals actually have become unsafe because their electrical, <coughs> water, and other systems fail. The overarching objective was never to build a school or a hospital, staff it, supply it, and otherwise maintain it in order to improve education or health in Afghanistan. The goal was simply to win a war and to do so at the lowest human and material cost possible. So what about that anecdotal evidence that sometimes you may hear about, about SERP successes? I think the Wall Street Journal and Washington Post did a story not too long ago about some SERP successes. Or how SERP has saved, saved troops' lives or built trust. There is some former uh, senior official in the Defense Department who keeps talking about how important and successful SERP was in furthering the security mission in Afghanistan and building and rebuilding the, and, and capturing the hearts and minds of the Afghan citizens. It may be true. It probably has helped to some extent. But I and none of my colleagues in the oversight community can verify any of those successes. No one can. More importantly, none of us can quantify how many lives SERP has saved and to what extent, if at all, the program further, furthered any of our security objectives. That type of attribution would be difficult to ascertain under great conditions here in the United States. But when I can't even tell what the program's basic objectives were, I certainly can't tell you whether it is succeeding or not, nor can DOD. I am often criticized, again, for focusing too much on the doom and gloom of Afghanistan reconstruction at the expense of so-called good news, unquote. In this regard, my critics are correct. I don't spend my time looking for good news stories to tell. And one of the reasons is, I'm, like, I'm an attorney. Like any good attorney, I get a brief from my client. My brief comes in these two books, 78 IG Act and the IG Act that created the SIGR. And I dare any of you to find in any of these documents that I am required or supposed to highlight success. My job is to highlight problems, mistakes, waste, fraud, abuse, and make recommendations on how to end it or to eliminate it. Uh, I don't spend my time looking for good news stories. If we find them, we love to tell them. But that is not my job. My job is to find out what is going wrong and try to get massive government agencies. And you can't believe how massive one is until you start looking at the DOD budget. Agencies that have been around for decades, if not centuries, and long before Cigar was created, to do better for the taxpayer. That is what my 
brief is. And when you become an attorney or our attorneys or you get a job working for whomever, whether it's AT&T or the Department of Homeland Security or DOD, what's your brief? What's your job? It be, should be clearly stated. Um, if it isn't, don't take the job. Uh, as I said before, I don't make the rules. I enforce them. It is the agencies who are responsible for defining the criteria by which the program should be evaluated. As we have seen, it becomes really difficult for SIGAR to assess reconstruction projects and programs if agencies don't set clear criteria or project management standards. We eat an equally frustrating and unbelievable occurrence is when agencies do not take the time to think about appropriate standards for their projects. And I'll give you a few examples. A few years back, USAID spent almost $15 million to build a hospital in Gardez, the provincial capital of Pakatia province. The effort was just one small part of a $57 million contract awarded to build health and education facilities throughout Afghanistan, which would then be turned over to the Afghans to operate and improve their health and the hospital hit a few snags in the building, it was a few months late, but overall it was a solidly built structure that ended up being 12 times larger than the previous hospital in Gardez. A headline that should have meant a huge increase in local health care capabilities and capacity. There was just one problem. You say did not assess the Afghan Ministry of Public Health's ability to operate and maintain the hospital once complete. In the end, you say managed, and the only thing it managed to do was increase the cost of the Afghans for operating a hospital in Gardez by a factor of five. I actually had the opportunity to talk to the Minister of Health in Afghanistan on my last trip, and he said that was one of his biggest concerns. Not just what you say did in Gardez, but what the international community has done. He had no visibility on what the international community, including the US, UK, and other allies, have provided to the Afghan people. And his concern is, they're leaving. What do I do now? And that was his major concern. He had some concern about missing clinics in his own Afghan system, but he says, my biggest problem is, what have the great international donors given me to try to manage? I wish I could say that what happened in Gardez is isolated. But this sort of thing, as the minister, the minister of education told me the same thing, and other ministers have told me, is a common occurrence in Afghanistan. You would have thought, after having worked in Iraq, after having worked in Haiti, and after having worked around the world in reconstruction efforts, way before I became the cigar, that we in the United States and the rest of the developing community would have been able to handle and foresee the problems when you over-donate, over-give, and don't consider sustainability when you do reconstruction. You would think at some point, somebody in the administration would wake up and say, you know folks, maybe we're going about this all wrong. It seems that time and time again, People have to be reminded in our administration, it's Afghanistan, it's not Kansas, it's not Norway, it's not Bethesda. I want to give people in the administration the benefit of the doubt on this kind of thing. Part of me is saying that perhaps these officials just want the Afghans to have high quality infrastructure. I try to remind myself of that when we build multi-billion dollar roads to U.S. and international weight standards in a country that has no ability to enforce weight limitations. Of course, the roads are crumbling. And of course, the Afghans don't have the funds and capabilities to maintain them. Or when a military official tells me of a brilliant idea to spend millions of dollars to build high-tech bus stops in Afghanistan, complete with solar-powered lighting, as, this, as if this were DC or Bethesda. Heck, I don't even have solar-powered lighting in my bus stop on River Road. 
but we're going to give it to the Afghans and assume they can maintain it. I basically told the general at that time, if you do that, it will be on the front page of the Washington Post or New York Times. Are you sure you want to spend that money? I can guarantee you a few things. If you spend that millions of dollars, it will be on the front page. Fortunately, and I'm assuming it's because he put his green eye shade on, but I think more likely he realized, oh, yes, this is going to appear in my performance review. But that is something we see all the time. It's not Bethesda. It's not Kansas. It's Afghanistan. Um, again, I am hoping that people have the best intentions in the world. But if I am doing my job and being the good umpire that I was appointed by President Obama to be, all I am seeing is a modus operandi that is woefully out of touch with reality at best and delusional at worst. We simply must be smarter with our reconstruction and foreign assistance. We have to be, if our country is going to play its critical role building peace and stabilization in war-torn societies for years to come. One of the points I keep reminding people time and again in this administration is that honesty is quite literally the best policy. Two and a half years ago, I sent the main players in the reconstruction game, the Departments of State, Defense, and USAID, a letter requesting that they identify, by their own judgment, the 10 most successful and 10 least successful reconstruction programs that they were working on, and why they selected the program. It was the reasoning I was very interested in. Two and a half years later, I'm still waiting to receive a straight answer from those three agencies. The agencies were not shy in responding and pointing out what they thought they were doing right in Afghanistan, although even that information suffered a bit from measurement and attribution problems. However, none of the agencies identified their top programmatic successes or shortcomings. Instead, Many of the responses identified Afghanistan's shortcomings, problems, and challenges, like corruption, poor rule of law, and lack of capacity, and chose to reiterate all the great things they were doing to address those issues. That wasn't my question. Give me your top 10 success stories, and why? Um, this is akin, what the agencies gave me, to uh, saying that you work too hard or you care too much when a prospective employer asks you to describe your greatest weakness in a job interview. I've been on the receiving end, and I highly recommend to you who are applying for jobs, don't give those answers if you ask that. It is disingenu disingenuous, and at the very least, it shows a lack of self-awareness. As the old ad adage goes, the first step to solving a problem is admitting that you have one. I would honestly fault those agencies less if they gave me a straight response and said, John, we think that Program X is not doing so hot because of Y. And we believe that because we put in place a system to measure Y and to look at our progress. At least then I know you have a basic, or they have a basic level of recognition that something isn't quite right and that they are looking to do something about it. By sending me a letter that is little more than a public relations, a PR exercise, I can logically only assume one of two things. They are intentionally dodging my question, which is never something good to do to an inspector general. That is unsettling. Or they are not being honest with themselves. And that is worrisome, given the vital task and the amount of money Congress has given them and they're charged with overseeing. A USAID senior official even told me later in a hearing that asking him to identify his agency's top successes was like asking him to choose which of his children he loved more. 
Who knew that Afghanistan reconstruction is the Sophie's choice of international <laughs> I was not impressed with that answer, and to say the least, the Congressional Committee wasn't either. I can tell you why. Program evaluation inevitably entails, or at least facilitates, comparisons of projects. If not, what basis would an agency manager have for deciding, say in the face of budget cuts, something Congress is discussing right now, sequestration, something that DOD is facing right now, or new mission directives, like what's going on in, Li in Libya, and what's going on in Syria, or whatever, which projects, you need to know that, to know which projects to prioritize, expand, con contract with, terminate, transfer, or redesign. How do these agencies decide which project managers deserve greater responsibility or career advancement? if you don't compare programs. Or in the worse, which managers need to be demoted or fired if you don't compare programs? How do they capture lessons learned to improve agency performance without comparing programs? Even if a formal process of comparing programs or project outcomes does not exist within an agency, I don't think it is unreasonable to ask for a limited, judgmental comparison of successes and failures as a general sanity check in what has become quite possibly the largest reconstruction effort by our government in the history of our republic. Comparing outcomes is, in addition to being good practice for managers, a part of the job for Inspector General the subject of formal guidance for executive branch departments and agencies by OMB since 2012, something I've tried to remind the agencies. Because OMB circular states, quote, agencies are encouraged to include measurements of costs and costs per outcome as part of the routine reporting of funded programs to allow for useful comparisons of cost effectiveness across programs. Once evidence-based programs have been identified, such a return on investment analysis can improve agency resource allocation and inform public understanding. That was behind my letter to the agencies. Tell me which ones succeed, which are 10 successes, and which fail, and why. Because OMB has required them to do that since 2012. Once again, Evidence-based decision-making rears its head. Many of you have gotten up going to working for OMB. That is something you're going to be focusing on. And you must hold the agencies that have evidence-based decision-making. It is a relatively simple concept and one that we really must employ if we expect improvement in any government agency, and particularly in the in, in, in increasingly complex and difficult environment of Afghanistan. So, here we are, almost 14 years into our trillion dollar effort, with over 2,000 American lives sacrificed. At the risk of sounding dramatic, if we can't honestly report and point to some realistic and relevant measurable accomplishments from this massive, massive investment, we will miss out on a crucial learning opportunity that will affect U.S. policy for generations to come. In short, we risk failing, failing to understand the conditions necessary not only to produce peace and prosperity there in Afghanistan, but to sustain it. That is the bigger picture in play for the United States in the conflict in infected environments of tomorrow, wherever they may be. We must not kid ourselves about Afghanistan. It will be a long struggle. Defeating a determined insurgency, improving health and education, altering attitudes toward women, reducing corruption, and building governmental com competence are not casual short-term undertakings. Indeed, in the realm of international community, international security today, hardly anything is clear-cut and easy as it initially appears. 
You know, in a radio broadcast, which you all are aware of as students of history, one year before the Nazis invaded Poland and World War II began, Neville Chamberlain famously opined, quote, how horrible, fantastic, incredible it is that we should be digging trenches and trying on gas masks here in England because of a quarrel in a faraway country between people of whom we know nothing. Today, Chamberlain's folly in Munich is a world-famous cautionary tale for would-be appeasers. And the events that set in motion the deadliest war in modern history have informed international relations theory and leadership decisions to this day. From Rwanda and Kosovo to Libya, Iraq, Syria, as well as good old Afghanistan, world leaders have recognized the danger of underestimating crises in little-known places far, far away. What has been less apparent, unfortunately, is the need for sustained interest in rebuilding the political and economic structures of war-torn nations. I think you see the result of that today with the crisis of all of the people in Europe coming up from Greece through Hungary to Germany and elsewhere. Still rarer, I would opine, is the recognition that this rebuilding process requires honesty, an honest assessment and reassessment of success and failure, folly and triumph. Now, General William Westmoreland, another name from the past, the American military commander during the Vietnam War, famously said after the war, quote, Militarily, you must remember that we succeeded in Vietnam. We won every engagement we were involved in, unquote. Today, I doubt many people, including U.S. military commanders who, or soldiers who served in Vietnam, would call Vietnam War a success. But Westmoreland wasn't wrong. Based upon the criteria he was using to judge success, he just chose to highlight progress against baselines that would tell his story the way he wanted it told. Without candid introspection, we will surely be doomed to repeat our mistakes in the far afield places of tomorrow, much like if we apply the Westmoreland test to our activities. It's for that reason that cigar will continue to work in Afghanistan. We will poke and we will prod U.S. agencies and contractors to set smart goals, collect better data, and make informed decisions. In short, to do better. We welcome your interest and support of that mission, just as I welcome your comments and questions right now. Thank you very much. Are you or uh, I'll, I'll do this? Yeah. Any questions? Yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is James Dickey. I'm a second year graduate student here, uh, but I'm also a recently retired U.S. Army. Um, so, to what degree do you think that the regular turnover of leadership within Afghanistan contributed to the inefficiencies of our development projects? Um, yeah, that's, that's the main question. I've okay. Got. I haven't quantified it, so I can't give you what we call a Yegas response. That's a generally accepted government accounting standard response. But uh, that is a constant uh, complaint I have heard since starting this job. And I've heard it from generals. I've heard it from <coughs> soldiers. I've heard it from ambassadors. I have heard it from the Afghans. And I've heard it from senior Afghan officials. Um, it's not just the military. It's a state other agencies that play over there. Uh, hey, look, uh, I've been doing this job for a little over three years. Since then, I've had uh, four commanders of ISAF. I've had uh, three ambassadors. Uh, God, I don't know how many heads of C-Sticka I've had. And you know, it, it's funny, the last head of C-Sticka was a really great guy. In our last quarterly report, we, we highlighted some of his very thoughtful approach. C-Stick is combined security, training, command, Afghanistan. 
uh, they're the guys who pump out a lot of the money and are trying to help the Afghans to develop their military. Uh, he even joked. He said, you know, I'm coming up with all these great ideas. And he came up with some really great ideas. He said, but, you know, I realize uh, I'll be on it in another month. And the next guy I'll say was, what the hell did Sinai do? You know? So I'm trying to document this and trying to build it. It is a problem. Now, is it an easy problem to fix? No. If you read Tom Ricks, he talks about the problem of rotating troops going back to Korea. Uh, even World War II, you read about some of the guys who've written about that. Rotating troops too has always been a problem. Vietnam was a whole disaster. We have never gotten it right, but it needs to be fixed. AID needs to fix it. You need to have people, at least at the senior level, if you're going to get the kudos for being the general who wins the war in Afghanistan, at least stick around to the end. You know, I mean, that would be one proposal I would make. I mean, if you're going to be the ambassador, if you're going to be in charge of aid, you know, I come in, I, I'm into accountability. So my people come in and say, okay, well, this road fell apart, or this bridge fell down. Oh, oh by the way, we spent $8 billion on counter-narcotics, and it's a total disaster. Who's accountable? Well, I don't know. I just got here. Well, how about the guy had, well, he only stayed for six months. Oh, and that guy left after three months or four months. There's no accountability. And I, if you were in the military in Afghanistan, I know a number of commanders who came in, the first thing you do, what do you do? You come in and say, the place is, I should use the term, it's a profanity, but this place is full of blank. My process was a total blank, you know? Oh, but I'm going to do boom, 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 and I'm, it's going to be a success. Okay? And then he moves on. And the next guy comes in and says, well, the guy before me was a total, and, and it, 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 there's no continuity. And the Afghans realize that. And the Afghans who are crooked, not everyone, but the Afghans who are crooked will play the game. You're a contracting officer rep. You're a core. Now, what is a core? Well, he may be a private. He may be a captain. He may be a lieutenant or whatever. He may be a guy who is an infantryman, an artilleryman. He's coming in now. He's the contracting the officer rep. What that means to you who don't know it, he's the one who's signing off to pay the contractors. Okay? So yeah, it sounds like we got a core here, a former core. He was a core. Okay? You come in. You've been hired and trained to blow things up. Maybe to do electronic eavesdropping, whatever. Now you're supposed to approve a school's electricity. You don't know your AC from your DC. Well, what do you do? The Afghan comes in and says, hey, you sign all this stuff, good stuff, good stuff, works well, bye bye, gone. We even know of times where they just wait till a, if there's a really good core, if there's a really good commander who's really hard nosed, they'll wait till he's ready to leave. They wait for the next guy to show up. You know, geez, I'm with the IR National Guard. Where the hell am I? You know, look, well, just sign all these papers and we'll make certain your toilet and your latrine is fixed. How many millions of dollars go out the door and get lost that way? No, we have to fix it. And I'm sorry, I'm going on. But <laughs> you're absolutely on point. We need to fix that. And we've recommended that. We're looking at lessons learned. We have a whole lessons learned team that's working on that. Actually, I think we got some, some graduates from this program who are actually helping us as analysts on that. And we, uh, uh, so hopefully that'll be one of the things we'll address. Again, we can only recommend it, but it's got to be fixed. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Sir, you compared this to the Marshall Plan earlier. How much of a factor do you think it is that, that post-World War II, we actually had a cessation of, you know, we had a surrender and, and um, fighting was over. And oh, yeah. in these current wars, that's that's not the case. We still have the competing priorities, and so the people we have there are not necessarily the right people <coughs> in the education to actually... I don't know if they're the right people or not. I wouldn't want to comment on that. Uh, everybody's gone in. The most majority have great motives, and they're, they're trying hard. But you, you do make a point. And the reason we make a reference to the Marshall Plan, because no one really can figure out money. I mean, you know, I've seen people analyze it by saying if you pile every dollar up to be really taller than the World Trade Center. Well, nobody knows how tall the World Trade Center was. I mean, you know, it's big. Um, so we try to compare on another reconstruction effort. If you actually, it's, but it's not a totally accurate comparison, apples and oranges. As bad as Europe was after World War II, at least those were functioning countries with infrastructures, with uh, uh, police forces and all that. Now you may, you know, they may have been co-opted by the Nazis or co-opted by the, the Soviets, but 
the, at least you had something in place. Afghanistan was the fourth century before we got there, and we bombed it back to the second, and everybody's been bombing it ever since. So it's not an exact comparison. What is interesting about Marshall Plan, and I, I'm not expert on the Marshall Plan, but from some of the people in my staff who have looked at it, they had a very unique approach, and maybe we could learn from the Marshall Plan. It's not really my job to do that now, but, but I think as a grad student, it'd be interesting to look at the Marshall Plan, how they do, dealt, dealt with oversight, and how they dealt with rebuilding, and compare it to some of our, our reconstruction. I think we can learn from the Marshall Plan. I don't know if that's a good answer, but, but obviously with uh, the Marshall Plan, it didn't go, we didn't have a war going on. There was no fight. Uh, Marshall Plan, we were dealing with countries that were kind of, well, they were blown apart, but at least you had functioning countries beforehand to bring this thing. And then uh, uh, I think we had a really good oversight function that Congress mandated that. Basically, they put people in every one of the agencies that took money from the Marshall Plan. And they were sitting there right with the Germans and the French never was getting uh, money. And I think we can learn a little bit. And actually, uh, I think that would be a great doctoral thesis for somebody who's compared to Marshall Plan to Reconstruction uh, right now. See if we can learn any lessons from that. It'd be great. Yes, ma'am. How much of this is being self-directed by the Afghanis? I mean, if 10 schools are being built, are they being built because the U.S. has determined that 10 schools need to be built? Or is it because the Afghanis have said, we we need 10 schools, can you please build these for us? Early on, I don't think we even talked to the Afghans on many of this stuff, um, and we found that. I mean, part of my seven questions, you can go online and find them. One of the questions is, do the Afghans know about it, and do they want it? Many times, the Afghans didn't even know the school <coughs> was being built until somebody gave them the keys. And I've had ministers talk, and basically that's what the Minister of Health is saying. I don't know what the Norwegians, the Swedes, the Chinese or whomever are doing out in the provinces. So nobody really consulted them. When they built the Gardez Hospital, they may have talked to some Afghan. They said, great idea, build it, and hire my brother as the contractor. And uh, uh, you wouldn't build a hospital that big. It bankrupt the uh, provincial health system. But when I talked about five times, all we did was accomplish by building something that's the cost is five times. It's also about two or three times the size of the entire provincial budget for healthcare at that one hospital. So obviously we really, really talk to the Afghans. So you need to include them. I think we're the new government, I think you got a new group that's more uh, cooperative and more supportive and more involved. Uh, but that's the other thing too, it goes back to the rotation. You're the aid guy who came in, you're working with an Afghan, you leave. Maybe the Afghan leaves. You don't even know who requested some of these programs. Yes, sir. So what do you see as the root cause for some of the lack of integrity or lack of being honest with ourselves uh, with the major agencies? Is it kind of padding their, you know, evaluation reports for certain individuals, or is it something different, you know, inter interagency fighting, or just, you know, something something else? It's a combination of all of what you're reading on. It's the incentive. We have incentivized failure. Whoops, I should be staying closer here. We have incentivized failure. Okay. <laughs> and it's not just in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, it's government-wide. Problems I am identifying and my staff have identified over the last three years are not indicative of a moral failure in aid or state or DOD or moral failure in what's indicative of a problem with the way our government is set up to work. We don't incentivize success. Because those, well, OMB puts out those regulations and that advice, it's not being implemented. And although Congress has their oversight hearings, they're not being listened to. So when you're a government employee in Afghanistan, you're working in an HR system that encourages you to spend money. You get promoted based about how much money you put in the contract. Okay? Well, that's the same incentive for somebody in the VA, back here, or HHS, or whatever. We have to change our entire approach.
approach to government. Accountability. When's the last time you heard of a federal employee fired? <laughs> now, trust me, if you steal $20, they'll try to fire you, you know? But if you're a general ambassador or an SESer and you blow through $350 million, as we found, $35 million, you know, they built a building that nobody needed, nobody wanted, and was never used, and DOD says there's nothing wrong with that. That was in one of our audits. You can take a look at it. Apparently it's okay, but you know, buck private. I mean, I talked to some, some uh, uh, warrant officer. He says, I just, we just cashiered a guy because he backed up a tractor and broke one of our beautiful planes. But a general who wastes $36 million, it's okay. Now, we got a problem with accountability. And that's not just in Afghanistan. That's wherever. And what if you're a whistleblower? I would not recommend any of you being whistleblowers and listening to a whistleblower to me, but I mean, I, I have counseled whistleblowers in my prior jobs on the Hill or when I was a private attorney. Being a whistleblower, you got to be a pretty damn brave woman or man because the system is out to get you and the bad guys will get you. And the government, as much as we talk about helping whistleblowers, it is few and far between help. And I have counseled many a person saying, do you really want to do this? And when I was a private attorney, I specifically said, do you really want to do this? This is what's going to happen to you. And I counseled one who was in the FDA, counseled one in the Pentagon, counseled one in the military, counseled one on Congress. And that's the, the last plantation. There, no protection, at least then, for congressional employees. Horrible. That's a problem with the government. That's not a problem in Afghanistan. It's not a problem with aid or state and all that. So what you're identifying is, and what you need to do as a student here, is look at the basics. Our employment system, our HR system, OPM, our procurement system. DOD procurement has been on a high-risk GAO, high-risk list since 1992. And I keep reminding that, because when's the last time you heard another IG mention the high risk list? The IGs as a whole need to go back to those high risk lists and keep pounding and pounding and pounding on the agencies. And going to Congress, going to the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, speaking at places like this and saying, look at these high risk lists. Why aren't you fixing them? What you saw in the VA and the killing the veterans, that all goes back to high risk lists that have been out there for years. Nobody's paid attention. So you need, and if you look at that little document we handed out, I'm going to steal it from the good professor here. He's dreaming of rowing tomorrow, I know that. Because <laughs> uh, he said to me, I call this the 4W. Who we are, what we do, why we do it and what we've accomplished. But why we do it is me speaking here and me talking to the press and me talking to them. You, one thing I've learned in the 25 years I've been in Washington, you are not going to change things for the better unless you keep banging the drum. And that's what he was saying about Congressman Dingle, former Chairman Dingle. Dingle realized, and I worked for Sam Nunn, the former Chairman of the Armed Services Committee, that you had to keep repeating, repeating the effort, the problem, getting allies. The ally is the press, the ally is other congressional members, the allies are think tanks, the allies are people who want to change things for the better. And after repeating it, then you will see an effectual change. When I was working for Dingle, I put on close to a dozen hearings on food safety dozen separate hearings in two years. <coughs> that was the way you effectuate change. You embarrass the food industry, you embarrass the FDA, you embarrass the Department of Agriculture, you embarrass the state of California. You made it an incentive for them to do good. That's how you effectuate change. And that's not being done enough in this town. You can't just do one hearing and then disappear. It's not going to change. You know that, we know that. And that's why we got problems with personnel going back to the Civil War problem. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Sir, thank you for coming out and saying that you set it up. Like, I, like you saw, I was a, a COR over in Afghanistan. <laughs> <about this. laughs> I know that was hitting close to home. So uh, you're not under investigation. Right, right. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. one, of, one of the things that seems What's your like, name again? <laughs> one of the things that seems like it's an issue, and I was curious on your recommendation of what you saw that works best, is integrating the Afghans into the decision-making process who are the correct elites to identify what are the true projects that are going to best benefit an area and at what level that might occur at. Because I've seen it either at brigade levels or even down at the low company or an advisor team level and seen it, different techniques used, but I didn't know with your experience and what you've seen, what seems to work for the well, best end result. I, I think the, the thing that works, and it, it, what, 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 what the questioner I think you're alluding to is the problem is you identify people uh, and they may actually be the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about Taliban, or they could be people who have their own axe to do a, uh, or ox to gore, I should say. Uh, <laughs> they have their own, uh, uh, you know, vendetta. They have a fight going on, or they just want to make a lot of money, and, and these are the people who you now have declared your friends. I think uh, uh, Sarah Chase, who... Uh, came out and spoke to my uh, office. We have a thing called the Cigar Salon where we bring in people. And uh, she talks about in her book, which I all highly recommend you all reading about, how her, uh, her Afghan advisor later turned out to be one of the most corrupt people in the, in the province. And she didn't realize it until years into it that this guy was the biggest crook in town. He was killing people and stealing things. So that's difficult. So what you need to do, so my answer to that is, I don't know at what level you think, you need good intel. DOD is supposed to be good at intel, you know? And uh, used to have subject matter experts in what they call FAOs, foreign area officers. Okay, I don't know if that bros programs exist. Uh-oh, somebody's eyeing he's a FAO over there. On top of being a core, he's a FAO. But look, at, I, I'm a strong believer. I, I, when I worked for Sam Nunn, I used to um, always uh, visit and, and talk to FAOs. And those guys basically knew a lot. And we spent a lot with the guys who did the Soviet stuff. So I, great trip, so I always get the Garmish to talk to U.S. Army, Russian Institute out there. And uh, um, these guys knew the area, and they knew the people. And there were, and there are subject matter experts who understand Afghanistan backwards and forwards, and they should have been able to tell our people, when you went into Kandahar, these are the guys you should avoid, these are the guys you should work with. I don't think they either were listened to, or the information got conveyed, or again, rotation, rotation, rotation. The first guy came in and said, well, I'm listening to this advisor, and he's telling me avoid these, these guys, and well, but I'm leaving, I'm back to Iowa, I'm going to the next, next guy comes in and he just meets the first Afghan on the street. So I don't know what happened, but there was a real disconnect. And you know, we're supposed to be good at intel. I mean, at least that's what everybody tells me, and I know part of it. Good percentage of my taxes go to support the intel guys. You know, you think we would know. Now, I'm not. Look, I wasn't born this year. I know the objectives of many times when you're a soldier coming in, your objective is totally different than somebody from state or aid. You're fighting war. You want to keep the casualties down. And if you've got to pay a bad guy to not shoot at your people, I am not going to condemn the commander for doing that but realize what you're doing, okay? You're paying a bad guy. Where's that money gonna go? I don't know. But money is a weapon. And you can use that properly or misuse it, but you gotta keep that in mind. Now, somebody from aid or state has a different approach. Uh, hopefully, they, have, they understand the area. But when you rotate so many people in so fast, I'm not certain everybody going into Afghanistan knew what Afghanistan was, or who's out there. You know, that was the funniest thing, I, because I, we, we hired a lot of people, and I had to fire a lot of people when I started. And a lot of people came in who said, well, I know everything about Afghanistan. I was in Iraq. <laughs> Let me follow that. Um, you, know, um, you know, I have a brain, but it doesn't make me a brain surgeon. I mean, Iraq was totally different than Afghanistan. And uh, some of that expertise we ignored to our peril. And unfortunately, we'll probably do it again. I hope to God 
we have some experts, and I know we do, on Syria. And I hope to God somebody in the government's listening, but I don't do Syria. So uh, I'll leave that to the next guy. But one of the things you got to have good intel. you got to be dealing with. Yes, ma'am. How much coordination is there with other countries regarding reconstruction? And where's the end point for cigar? For this entire Oh, project? two issues. Uh, the end, well, let me, how much co coordination, it, it all depends. Some of it is good, some of it is not. I can give you anecdotal pieces. I mean, I remember doing uh, an investigation. Uh, we actually traveled over to, uh, well, I keep coming out here and I'm supposed to be behind here. So. <laughs> uh, I've always liked to have a moving target. But uh, uh, we, we did an investigation and we raised some issues you probably read about, about uh, 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 ghost uh, policemen over in Afghanistan. And uh, actually the person who alerted me to that problem was President Ghani, before he was president. He said, you gotta watch out about your paying salaries for people who don't exist. So I, uh, we got wind of a audit done by the EU, European Union's office. And uh, uh, we were over there uh, getting briefed uh, on their uh, OWAF is the name for their, it's French, I have no idea what it stands for, uh, but it sounds great, which I like to work for an agency called OWAF. But uh, they, uh, they had done an audit on problems with the UNDP, the UN office that was running a trust fund over there to pay police salary. I said, wow. He says, you know, they're ghosts. We've documented it and all these other problems. So our staff trundles back to Afghanistan. I'm there and I'm briefing and getting an interview with the head of C-Sticker, not General Semini, one of his predecessors, one of his many predecessors. I think I've gone through 10 C-Sticker. And uh, we said, so what do you think of this Olaf interview? <coughs> his reaction was the same as many of you. What? Olaf who? I said, no, they're the EU, because I was so smart now, they're the EU audit agency. It's a French name, of course. I said, well, what do you think about the ghosts? He said, what ghosts? I said, you mean the EU hasn't told you they got an audit on ghost police that we are paying for to the tune of millions and millions of dollars? And he said, no, well, I'll get in and look into that. Fortunately, the successor, by the time I came back again, there was a new NC sticker, they had started looking into it. So my question is, Good coordination, cooperation? No. You know, the Europeans weren't talking to us, we weren't talking to them as to serious problems. At least share information about fraud. I'd like to hear about it. Try to get some information from the UN on fraud. Those guys won't tell you anything. So coordination and cooperation, not the best. And I can cite chapter and verse on where we decide to do conditionality, and some other country comes in and says, eh, who cares about conditionality? We have to spend a lot of money. So they spend it. Another great example, last, every time I go to Afghanistan, I always meet with the Europeans. It looks like I'm the only guy who meets with our allies on a regular basis. So I meet with them, and uh, we did this audit on a $36 million program to bring soybeans to Afghanistan problem with it is we never talk to the Afghans. Uh, the Afghans don't grow soy, they have no market for soy, they don't eat soy, they don't like soy. You know? they, so what a great idea. Let's create a program for the Afghans. So the fields to grow the soy are up here, there's no milling process, it's down here, there are no roads connecting. What do you think happens after two years? $36 million goes out of the, the, the uh, gets wasted. Well, I'm attending a meeting in the Korean ambassadors there. And the Korean says, oh my God, soy. We have a great soy program. It worked. I said, really? And he said, yeah. How did it work? He said, well, we sat down and talked to the Afghans and we did a real planning and we built the soy. The soy fields are right next to the soy mill. We incentivized it. We had a market for them to sell the soy and all of that. Now, we're following up on that because we think that's a lesson to learn. How come our soy program was a total waste and their program worked? So, but we talked to our USA people, they'd never heard of the Korean program. A lot of cooperation here. 
I mean, it's only $36 million. Let's add it among friends, like, you know, uh, Senator Dirksen used to say. A million here, a million there, and you're talking big bucks. Oh, when do I go out of existence? Wow. Not soon enough for many people in the Asian state and DOD. But uh, by statute, and again, it's my brief, the cigarette goes out of existence six months after the amount of authorized, appropriated, but not yet spent money falls below $250 million. As I told you, there's $12 billion in the pipeline right now, and we appropriated another six. I think $6 billion uh, for next year. So we could be around for a long while, but you know, who knows? We, we exist at the uh, pleasure of Congress. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Kate Easley. Thank you so much for coming today. Pleasure. Um, in, in all your experience trying to get these agencies just to define and provide metrics, have you seen any lessons learned, obviously with the ex exception of obvious and catastrophic failures of projects, but of how you can successfully define metrics that actually can be evaluated um, when it comes to the effectiveness of programs that exist in a really dynamic environment with a lot of kind of conflicting influences? You know, I, uh, there have been successes, and, 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 and usually they've been smaller programs. Um, they, if, you, if you go back to my seven questions, they usually are answered pretty much in the affirmative one. We, uh, they meet our national security and our foreign policy objectives. That's one of the things. Programs that usually involve talking to, including the Afghans early on. That's another example. Um, we, there are programs usually designed that uh, consider sustainability. Can the Afghans sustain? So therefore, they're usually smaller in a certain area. And uh, there's a, a bunch of others. They, they consider the, the corruption aspects. They have oversight, uh, et cetera. So those programs tend to succeed more often than not. Um, you know, they, you build realistic metrics. You build and include realistic goals. And you go in with your eyes open uh, as to what works or what doesn't. I mean, there are some international organizations, I think the Aga Khan uh, Foundation has done some excellent work. Uh, there are some other uh, smaller charities who have done excellent work with U.S. money and their own money or uh, international money. But they're usually smaller, they're usually more focused, and they definitely involve the Afghan community or the government uh, to a great extent. You're more likely to succeed. And that sort of tells you something. And more likely, these programs have people who stay on the ground for long periods of time. They're not federal employees. They're contractors for... Uh, they work for the agencies. The other thing that I, I, I will say that some of these agencies do better than we do, and that is conditionality. They put real conditions, and the Afghans know they're not going to get the money. I think a classic example, if you go to Iraq, well, which you can't go to anymore because it's not safe, but uh, the Aga Khan Foundation uh, supported the rebuilding of the uh, of some uh, archaeological spot there. I can't remember what it's called. Um, beautiful. They spent all this money um, and they were going to turn it over to the Afghans. And uh, as a condition, they had to come up with a plan to sustain it. The Afghans did. And part of that sustainment plan was a source of funding. So if this uh, 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 entity, or this uh, facility was open, it had to collect money. And the money had to go to maintaining the facility. And uh, uh, under Karzai, the Afghan government, all money collected by any government, had, any government agency had to go to the capital. And uh, Aga Khan said, sorry, we're not going to give you the keys. So it's been built. And I, I haven't been to Hawat uh, two and a half years, because it's not safe two years since they attacked our consulate there. Um, I mean, last time I was in Harada, I was surrounded by soldiers and never got off the base. But, uh, um, but that's conditionality. It's real conditionality. It's beautiful, and I wish I could remember the name of the facility. Uh, it's a great historical site. Uh, but Aga Khan isn't turning it over. At least I don't think they've turned it over because now maybe the new unity government has designed a system for that. So, uh, uh, but that's real conditionality, and that helps. 
proven program success. We have, uh, we're, we're getting down. I think we should end at six. Do you have a question? Uh, well, I asked one earlier, but I do have another question. Remember, um, you're standing between everybody, all your colleagues. Yeah, eating, I know. I'm a bad but, man. Uh, but that's okay. I've done that before. Yeah. Just, um, the provincial reconstruction teams. Yeah, PRTs. Yeah, PRTs. Did you find them? Uh, I'm sure they were inconsistent. I knew they were inconsistent. But did, would they find it a good mechanism or at least a useful mechanism for development projects? Or were they just another broad idea that never quite worked? You know, I, I, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, and we have a team looking at PRTs. And I, I, I want to wait till that lessons learned team gets back. I think the concept was a good concept. And I think it has been... Um, it's been varied depending where and what country was running the PRT. Some have been very successful, some have not. So I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm in a way dodging it because my team hasn't done it, done the answer, so I don't want to give you the wrong information. Um, it, it, it just all depended where you were and whatever. But that's an interesting concept that we're looking at. Um, the one thing, and I do know you want to eat and drink, and I don't want to stand away in front of somebody who wants to eat and drink. Um, I think that's on Patreon. But uh, <laughs> uh, security. We haven't really talked about that. Security situation in Afghanistan. I mean, the Afghans are doing most of the fighting. They're holding their own. And we haven't really did touch on that. But that's, that's another important area where you can't lose sight of. Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're bleeding and they're dying. But the security situation there is not and uh, it's like I've been doing this for three years, and it's far less of the country I can see. And every time I come, there's less of the country I can see. Uh, so we're hoping for the best. This is the fighting season is still ongoing and the ending. We don't know when it's going to end. Uh, we hope it works out for them. The other thing is, I would say it is on an optimistic note. Uh, new unity government. Uh, it's not a government that I think uh, either. Uh, uh, President Johnny or uh, CEO Abdullah would prefer. Uh, I don't think it's a government we would prefer, uh, or the Afghan people would prefer. But it is functioning, and it's bumping along, and uh, very impressive in some points of view from us, our point of view, uh, on uh, at least they're saying the right thing and doing the right thing, particularly on fighting corruption. We have been very successful, or far more successful, with the new unity government on handling corruption cases. That becomes far more important. Now, there are things that they have not done to our satisfaction, or to the embassy, or state, or aid's satisfaction. But that's something we can only hope for the best, with the new unity government. Um, Ghani, I met, I meet with him, or uh, the CEO, on every trip I've made since uh, January which uh, I never wasted my time meeting with the governor. Um, I've met with individual governors and ministers, but not, never with the palace. The palace is very much interested in fighting corruption. So that's a very good sign, particularly as we go more and more to direct assistance, direct on budget assistance, where the money goes directly to the Afghan government to spend. Because they're the ones who have to be the eyes and ears and prosecute and help uh, ferret out corruption because uh, I don't have jurisdiction over an Afghan. He says nobody does except the Afghans. So we're working with them, and I, it, it, it is a tremendous change. And I don't so I don't want to leave being totally down, uh, doomsday uh, advocate. But uh, we hope the best, and I think we all should. And, and there is a future for you working in Afghanistan. We're going to be there for a while, and uh, it does need smart people who know the language and know the culture. Likewise for Syria or wherever else. There is nothing like knowing the language. Now, I'm very proud of myself. I speak English fluently. Uh, some people even say I'm a native speaker, of old gibberish is my native language. But uh, trust me. Learn a foreign language, understand a foreign language, and if you're going into this area, understand the culture of the deal. It's not Kansas. Okay? And the 
problem now is our aid people, our state people, our DOD people are not getting outside the wire. They're sitting inside the wire, talking to each other, and talking to those Afghans who are willing to come over and meet them in the embassy compound. That's not good. Because you basically have an echo chamber. And that's very, very dangerous as we continue. But security has uh, become uh, intense. But with that said, thank you very much. Let the record show he tried to end on a little bit of an upbeat note. <laughs> Never could. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, yeah.